The Bible may be the most influential book of all time. It's almost certainly the best-selling book ever. So, who wrote the Bible? Well, the Bible is actually a collection of books. In fact, the word Bible comes from the Greek ta biblia, which means literally the books, plural. So what we're really looking at here is more akin to an ancient library. It's a really big question who wrote the dozens of books in it. But in this video, we're going to start by looking at who wrote the first five books of the Bible. And they are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. These five books are collectively known as the Torah, which in Hebrew means the law. They're also known as the Pentateuch, which just derives from the Greek for five scrolls. According to religious tradition, the Torah was written by Moses. God dictated to Moses as he wrote down the Torah. And therefore it's also known as the five books of Moses. However, there are a number of problems with the idea of Mosaic authorship. Firstly, the last verses of Deuteronomy actually describe the death of Moses, so he would have had a hard time writing about that. More fundamentally, there's not a lot of evidence outside the Bible that Moses ever existed. The written records, Egyptian and Mesopotamian, although they're extensive, contain no reference to Moses. And equally, there's no archaeological evidence of a great movement of people out of Egypt through the Sinai Desert, as Moses was supposed to have led. So therefore, the, the idea that Moses wrote the Torah is not convincing. Let's put a cross through that idea. But if Moses didn't write the Torah, who did? Well, we can find clues when we look closely at the text itself. For example, when we open the Bible to the book of Genesis chapter 1, God creates the world in six days and rests on the seventh. Then in the very next chapter, there is a story of Adam and Eve. Almost as if the creation of the universe recounted in chapter 1 had never happened. When we turn to the story of Noah's Ark, we find Noah and his sons entering the ark on two separate occasions. First, in Genesis chapter 7, verse 7, Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives entered the ark to escape the waters of the flood. And then as though it hadn't happened, in verse 13, they enter the ark again. So the Bible's a bit repetitive, but it's more than that. It's also inconsistent at times. At one point, the Bible tells us that God instructs Noah to take two of all living creatures onto the ark with him. But then a few verses later, God delivers the same instruction except with a difference. It's one pair of every unclean animal, but it's seven pairs of every kind of clean animal. Biblical scholars call these repetitions doublets. And I really encourage you to read the book of Genesis to check these doublets out for yourself and see if you can identify any others. The point about doublets is not to say we found mistakes, we caught you out. It's that scholars believe doublets actually provide clues about who wrote the Torah. So this is really exciting stuff. In 1882, a German biblical scholar, Julius Wellhausen, published a book in which he had he advanced what is called the documentary hypothesis. According to Wellhausen's theory, the first five books of the Bible derive from four distinct sources, or documents, composed by different authors at different times. The documents were subsequently edited together into a single whole, producing doublets in the process. And that's what this diagram shows. Different sources, like J and E up the top, are all ultimately fused together into the Torah down the bottom. After publishing his book, Julius Wellhausen resigned from his academic post because he felt his theory was not exactly helping the student pastors or ministers that he was meant to be training. After all, the implication of the documentary hypothesis 
was that the Torah was not a divine creation, but a human one. Today there is broad consensus amongst scholars in support of some version of the documentary hypothesis. So let's start looking at each source one by one, beginning with the source known as J. Ancient Hebrew, like any other language, evolved over time. In the same way as a phrase like, wherefore art thou, might have been perfectly ordinary in Elizabethan English, but sounds foreign to contemporary English speakers, Hebrew changed over the centuries. It's on this basis that scholars believe J is the oldest source and dates to around 900 BCE, almost 3,000 years ago. The distinctive feature of J is that in this text, and this text only, God is referred to by a proper name, Yahweh. And as a result, the J source is also known as the Yahwist. In the 19th century, when Wellhausen was working, Yahweh was mistranslated as Jehovah, and hence it became known as the J source. J not only refers to God in a unique way, J actually conceptualizes God in a manner that's very different to other parts of the Torah. Let's return to the story of Adam and Eve and think about what Yahweh is like in this story. When Yahweh creates Adam, he uses dust, and Yahweh breathes life into Adam. He makes Eve by taking a rib from Adam. And think about this. After Adam and Eve disobey Yahweh by eating from the tree of knowledge, they hide from him. Yahweh calls out, Where are you? So Yahweh has very human traits and human qualities. He's a creator, for sure, but he's a kind of divine craftsman, and he's not all-seeing or all-knowing. Contrast Yahweh with the God that creates the world in six days in Genesis chapter 1. God just says, let there be light, and there's light. God no longer works in human ways or possesses human qualities. He's a kind of cosmic deity. And we can observe that there is a central point to the story of the creation of the world in chapter 1 that is completely missing from the story of Adam and Eve. It concludes, God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested. It's all about the importance of the Sabbath as a day of rest. And this kind of concern with ritual observance is typical of what is known as the priestly source or P. Recall the doublet in the flood story we talked about, where one version says God instructed Noah to take a pair of every animal onto the ark, and in the second version, it's seven pairs of every kind of clean animal. Well, it was very likely that P inserted this latter direction, because the priestly source is concerned with ritual sacrifices being performed correctly and clearly didn't like the thought of Noah being prevented, at risk of extinguishing a species, from making the appropriate sacrifices to God. Wellhausen dated P to around 500 BCE, but scholars today believe it may be older than that by a century or more. The next source, E, is known as such because in these texts, God is referred to as Elohim, the generic Hebrew word for God and not as Yahweh, as in the J source. So the E stands for Elohist. After the death of King Solomon, around 900 BCE, tensions between the tribes of Israel led them to break into two kingdoms. The E source is believed to have been created in the northern kingdom of Israel. A lot of biblical stories valorise the second son, like Isaac or Jacob, and it is believed that the E source is kind of using the second son as a symbol of itself, as a breakaway kingdom or second kingdom of the Israelites. The E source is believed to date from around the 9th century BCE. The fourth source, D, or the Deuteronomist, is known as such because this author is believed to have written the whole of the final book of the Torah the book of Deuteronomy. 
The Deuteronomist is also believed to have written the subsequent books in the Bible, following the Torah, that tell the biblical history of the early centuries of Israelite presence in Canaan, or what today we call Israel-Palestine. These books combined are known as the Deuteronomistic History, or DH, in our diagram, and they're believed to date from around 600 BCE. So, doublets, plus the diverse language preoccupations and even beliefs we find in the Torah, have led scholars to believe that the four sources, J, E, P and D, were created by different authors at different times. And only much later were they combined together something like this, in which the different documents are spliced together, creating doublets in the process. We should also add on the Deuteronomist, who authored a more discreet chunk of the Torah. According to the documentary hypothesis, a figure called R, or a kind of editor or adapter, compiled J, E, P and D into the Torah. The question is, who was the redactor? And what motivated them to combine different texts into a single whole? In 587 BCE, the Babylonian Empire, the cream-coloured crescent on the map, conquered the land of the Israelites, Canaan. This foreign conquest would have been all the more traumatic for the ancient Israelites as Canaan was the land promised to them by their God. The catastrophe was heightened by the destruction of the temple. This was the one central temple where God was believed to dwell and at which the Israelites worshipped him. And now it had been destroyed. Additionally, much of the population was deported into captivity in Babylon. So we need to imagine a people who have been exiled from their homeland, indeed whose, whose whole world has been destroyed. All they had linking them with their past and with everything they held dear were their writings. These writings now assumed a heightened importance. Multiple texts what we have called J, E, P and D, were combined into one official sacred history. The Torah, the first five books of the Bible, were probably edited into the form we know today, sometime around the period of the Babylonian captivity in the 6th century BCE. Faced with worldly catastrophe, perhaps the hope was to create not only a source of solace and guidance, but something permanent and indestructible. If that indeed was the goal of the authors and editors of the Torah, they succeeded mightily 